Great. Again, welcome, everybody. You're in the very first session of our Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes Bike Walk Roll Summit, our second virtual version. And um, we're going to get started. So hello, my name is Rachel Schaefer. I use she, her pronouns. I am the uh, policy and advocacy manager for Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes. Um, welcome to the summit. We are excited to have you here for this five day virtual event. And we're thrilled that we have so many people from different communities across the state. Um, we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. This summit is virtual, uh, but those participating are joining us from many lands. Uh, we acknowledge that the land that Cascade Bicycle Club sits on today as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. If you don't know what lands you're on, uh, take a look in the chat in a minute or so, and you'll see a link to a map where you can look up uh, the place on the land that you are in. Uh, without them, we would not have access to this environment, and we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. Um, we would also like to note that this session is being recorded and it'll be available following the summit. So, oops, there we go. This summit is hosted by both Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations um, who, with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and abilities through Washington State, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride and holding events and rides. Washington Bikes advocates for bicycles, bicyclists' rights, endorses political candidates, hold officials accountable, and works to shape policies that make bicycling safe and accessible for all. We also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, whose collective contributions have enabled us to bring together 15 panelists this week with expert speakers and with registration free for all attendees. So thank you to our sponsors, Amazon and the Washington State Department of Transportation. And now I'll quickly introduce the panelists, although they'll have a little more time to introduce themselves and the topic, and then we will pass it off to them. So this morning we're hearing from Kelly Reefer from Move Redmond and Bill Bender from the Spokane Summers Parkways. Um, this is again, building community through open streets. This session shares lessons and takeaways from open streets events around the state. Uh, providing recommendations, lessons learned, and key tools for municipalities and organizations interested in hosting their own open streets event. As we work to build more connect connected communities in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, attendees will learn how these open streets can contribute to that connectivity. Uh, here's our presentation format, and I'm going to pass it off to Bill to begin his section of the presentation. So, I'm going to stop sharing, and Bill, you can feel free to share your screen. All right. Thank you, Rachel. Let me just take a moment. All right. Thank you very much. So I'm representing Spokane Summer Parkways, an open street event that we've had since 2010. Um, it was first inspired by, by seeing the video uh, entitled Cyclovia uh, done by Street Films uh, uh, regarding the, uh, the event that, that's now well established in Bogota, Colombia. Um, and I would recommend that if any of you are, are newbies to open street events and haven't seen uh, that video, uh, that Street Films video that you do it, it, it uh, I've, I've viewed that video I don't know how many times and it still gets my heart pumping fast. Uh, to see it. It's, it's exciting and inspiring. Um, we have been doing Spokane Summer Parkways since 2010, um, and they are currently, it's currently being done once a year. Um, my intent uh, is to describe uh, what we've done and the, and the processes that we've gone through, uh, and the realization that, uh, that what's working for us in Spokane um, is, is unique to our event, uh, and that e each uh, locale and each group of, of planners will find what works for them in their, uh, in their locale. So it's, it's, it's not, ours is, what I'm gonna present is not necessarily prescriptive, uh, it's, it's illustrative. Um, 
Currently we do, as I say, we do one event per year. Uh, it's somewhere right around the summer solstice within days of the summer solstice. Uh, we do them in the evening um, from six to 9 p.m. Uh, we do these uh, while school is still in session, hopefully. Uh, so that uh, the large population of Spokane that takes off for the summer, that takes off to the lakes for the summer, um, is still around. Um, we do it, as I say, on a, on, a, on a weeknight after school and after work. Um, this came about uh, in 2010 when uh, we approached the mayor of Spokane, who, who happened to be particularly bike friendly, uh, and got her on, on board. Um, we had already established some credibility uh, through an event called Spokefest, which was a, a large community bike ride that our, our group has, that our group organized in 2008 uh, and was a, a screaming success. Um, so we were able to go to the mayor and, and uh, uh, with already established organizational skills uh, and, and some idea of the logistics uh, and we're able to make a, a, a sell. Um, when we first did it, our, our, in the first year, we had, we had um, three dates of, of doing it, uh, all on the, on the same three-mile course. We had done it um, uh, centered around several downtown parks. We used the, 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 these parks as hubs for the event. Um, and we really, unfortunately, didn't involve the neighborhoods or didn't get the neighborhood buy-in that we, that we would have liked. Um, we did our first ones back in 2010 on, on several Sunday mornings, uh, and we found that that probably wasn't optimal either. So we experimented in the next few years. We tried it with different parks, with, with neighborhood parks rather than the big downtown parks. Um, and, we start, and we started to get some neighborhood involvement, but uh, the, the amount of involvement seemed to vary depending on the, probably on the, uh, on the, the demographics of the neighborhood. Um, we did them, uh, we did them at, at different days of the week, at different times of day. Um, and what we found that the best success for us is that our, our, we close four miles of streets for our event currently. We've, the, the event that we do now, we've, we've been doing for probably the past six or seven years, um, and we've decided to stick with it because it's been so successful. Um, it's, a, it's about a four mile loop, uh, and, it and we use three park locations as, as hubs for the event. Um, it connects two large neighborhood parks, uh, to, to places that, that people from all around the city find very desirable to come and visit. Um, and we've had great community response from these neighborhoods. I have to admit these neighborhoods are probably of uh, the highest socioeconomic uh, class uh, of, of the city of Spokane um, and, and seemingly the, the greatest uh, community involvement. Um, So beside getting the community involved, um, we found it important to, to line up vendor, what we call vendors. And, and the name vendor sounds like somebody who's, who's selling something, um, but it's really people who, who have things to sell, people who have demonstrations to do, people who help us put on the event. Um, we've encouraged vendors We've encouraged vendors to promote themselves and also to, to try to present something uh, at the event that would be kid and family friendly. So I'll give you some examples of some of the things that, we've, that vendors have, have come up with doing. Uh, we've had kid gymnastics and kid yoga. Uh, we have, we have a, a group that, that comes every year. This is, this is hard to explain, but what you see in this picture uh, is a bike pulling two trailers uh, and the trailers have sound, uh, a full sound system and play tango music so that, uh, so that uh, group tango lessons and tango dancing on the street happen. Uh, and this has been a big hit. 
Um, we've done something called conductor assize, which uh, uh, we've had uh, a symphony conductor come out and hand out sticks like batons uh, and have, uh, have uh, aerobic uh, symphony uh, uh, direction and, uh, and uh, conducting. Um, we've had uh, bumper bubbles. A company was promoting was promoting these, uh, and I don't know if you can quite tell from this picture. This was unfortunately the, the most close-up picture that I had. Um, but there are these big bubbles that uh, that have a that are like a sleeve that you crawl into, and and you run around a big grassy area and and bump into each other and knock each other down, which sounds which sounds terrible, but look like an awful lot of fun. Uh, we've had uh, portable slack lines uh, put up by a physical therapy group. Um, we've had scoot, scoot bike uh, race courses and, and skill courses. Uh, and Zumba in, uh, held on, on uh, tennis courts or on basketball courts. Um, we've had somebody promoting elliptigos. We've had street chalk drawing. Um, and we've had challenge courses. So these just give an, ex an example of some of the things that, uh, some of the things that the activities that uh, have been very popular. Um, we've encouraged people to, we've encouraged vendors to set up anywhere on the course, um, but, we'll, but from a practical standpoint, we found that most of the vendors will set up around hubs. So that as, so the way that things are laid out, people will, will make their way around the course, participants will make their way around the course and then stop and partake of the activities that are all centered around the hubs. Um, food trucks are invited and, and uh, on a hot summer night, ice cream is always a, a, a big hit. Um, as far as course logistics, um, a, a week before the event, we go around, uh, we go around the course and hang signs on, on doors uh, for of the residents who live along the course and just let them know what's coming their way. Uh, let them let them know plans in case uh, emergency uh, travel is needed during the time of the event on uh, on the closed streets. Um, we've had to coordinate with the police and the fire department again so that they have so that we have a coordinated emergency evacuation plan in case for instance, uh, uh, an, an ambulance and EMTs uh, need to get to somebody's house uh, on a part of the course that's closed. Um, as it turns out, when we, when we come around with, with the door hangers a week before the event, um, people who've, who've lived on the course uh, get excited. They greet us at the door uh, and, and uh, have, a, have tremendous memories of, of the event from years gone by. Uh, and, and very much look forward to it. So it gets people pumped up. Um, we've learned that, we've learned through the police department that crossing busy streets should be minimized um, and that the police are needed to help uh, control the, the, the traffic on busy streets. That cannot be done by our volunteers or members of the committee. It takes special certification to control, to control traffic on arterials. Um, we barricade the streets uh, a block away from the course with signs saying street closed ahead. Um, and we have volunteers at, at the point on the course uh, where the course is actually fully blocked off. Um, it would be ideal to have volunteers at, at all intersections um, but I think probably the, the most common thing that we've heard from other people putting on events uh, is the difficulty getting and, and retaining volunteers. Um, we, we try to contact people and get things coordinated in advance. And unfortunately, uh, one of the realities is, is that at the last minute, sometimes people don't show up and intersections are not, are not staffed. And so what we do is we identify the key intersections that we want to staff first, uh, and then the other intersections that are somewhat more expendable in case somebody doesn't show up. Um, 
Other things that, that we've had to try to keep interest in it, we've had a sort of a passport or scavenger hunt type of activity um, so, that, uh, so that we've identified uh, some of the vendors who are participating in this, we've identified them by, by having balloons, mylar balloons at their, at their stop uh, and passing out from the hubs, passing out cards, mostly for kids, but also for adults to check off when they've stopped at, uh, at, the, different, uh, at the different ballooned locations. Uh, and then they get to enter the cards for a big drawing at the end. We've had bike decorating contests that have been a big success and obviously, as you can tell, lots of fun. And what we find since, since we do this in a neighborhood rather than in the downtown area, um, we found that a lot of people have, ev have events at their own house to, to coincide with this. So uh, it's not uncommon to see people having a big, a big barbecue get together in their front, in their front yard uh, and to cheer on the people who are participating in the event. Um, we've had, um, so we've had to make special adaptations for these past two years with COVID. Um, we, uh, rather than prescribing a, a specific night and specific time uh, to have the event, um, we've opened it up to a week-long window and have, have had, and have had virtual Spokane summer parkways. Um, to make it interesting, we've had, we've had a, uh, a quiz of things that people might see along the course um, with, a, with an online quiz to, to answer uh, an entry into a big drawing. Uh, this, was a, this was a big success. Uh, and getting people to come out uh, whenever it was convenient for them uh, to do the course and get a and get a close look at the course uh, and to not accumulate a crowd. Uh, and I think that I think that we'll probably continue to to uh, to keep this as part of the event even when we go back to to having an in-person event on a specific night and specific time. Um, a little anecdotal story just talking about community involvement. Um, two years ago, we had one of the worst downpours I've ever seen in Spokane that happened just during the, the three hours, the six to nine o'clock hours that we had the event. Um, it was uncanny. We had had beautiful weather leading up to that. Um, it was absolutely drenching and you had to seek shelter. And what we found was that people in the neighborhood invited participants to come up on their front porch to ride out this storm. Um, and I'm sure that new friendships were made. Um, so, so we see this as, a, as, as definitely a community event and a community building event. And I think that's all I'm gonna say for now. And I'm gonna pass this over to Kelly who will tell us about her event in Redmond. And I need to stop sharing. Should be yours to share. Kelly. One moment, let me get my presentation up. There we go. Can you see the screen? Thumbs up. Okay. So hello, my name is Kelly Reefer. I am the Advocacy and Communications Director for Left, uh, for Move Redmond. And we just hope it, oh, had our first Open Streets event, Let's Move Redmond, this past September, on um, Sunday, September 12th. Um, it was really great to hear about um, some of the lessons that Bill uh, shared from Spokane Summer Parkways. We'll um, share a few slightly different lessons. Um, before I get started, I want to give a quick introduction to who Move Redmond is and why we wanted to do an Open Streets event. 
Uh, prior to 2021, Move Redmond was known as the Greater Redmond Transportation Management Association. Um, TMAs, as they're often called, uh, were formed in the 90s to help large employers reduce their drive alone rates as a part of our commute trip reduction. Um, in 2019, Gertman's board developed a new strategic plan for us to be more vocal and visible advocates for streets, trails, and transit in Redmond. And we just rebranded this year to be Move Redmond. And we wanted to be a little bit more community facing, which gets us into why we wanted to do an open streets event. Um, prior to this year, Gertma had, um, Gertma had organized a commute uh, trip challenge for people biking, and it was called Tour to Redmond. It was a really great way to get you know some of the employees of large uh, large employers to bike more. Um, but when we were planning for this year, we wanted to do something that was a little bit different and more of an invitation for folks to come out and reimagine our streets as a place for people. Uh, this really met a lot of our goals as an organization. We wanted to build great relationships with more of our community partners, and we wanted to reach people of all ages and abilities uh, beyond the folks who are just kind of employed and inspired to bike um, whatever the distance of their commute is. Uh, we also see open streets as an opportunity to be a really great platform for our advocacy, um, specifically around biking. Um, in the picture, you can see our little kids bike rodeo where we had kids on the street uh, learn to manage uh, stopping and turns and things like that. Um, a few kind of just logistics of what it took to get started planning this event. I'll go into more detail on some of these aspects. Um, the first one is selecting a route. I think Bill did a great job talking about the different ways they experimented with route uh, selection. For us at Move Redmond, we really wanted to focus on the downtown core uh, for our first year. If you've been to uh, the city of Redmond, there's a wonderful park downtown called Downtown Park. And there's also a trail nearby called the Redmond Central Connector Trail. Light rail is coming along the Redmond Central Connector Trail in just a few years. And we wanted to do an event that um, really kind of highlighted the, the possibility for what this downtown could be if we created more space for people. And so we also wanted to really try to engage the business community to get more business, uh, local businesses on board with things like bike improvements and more space for people to walk and encouraging folks to take transit too. So we're trying to be really multimodal within our uh, kind of route selection. Um, the second kind of piece was getting a permit from the city. Uh, we submitted a proposal for our event through the City of Redmond Special Events Permit. We just went through kind of the standard process and I'll talk a little bit more about some lessons learned there because we learned quite a bit in the attempt to get a permit. And then I just want to name that um, you will need some sponsors for this kind of event. Um, for our event, we were really lucky to have some um, sponsors from our previous Tour to Redmond event that stayed on. And then an Open Streets event was a really great um, opportunity for local businesses like Mayuri to come on and be sponsors. We also really want to encourage folks to do in-kind sponsorship. Um, we were really lucky to have a local print shop, Signorama, print our beautiful posters as an in-kind donation, as well as having folks like Zico who uh, donated materials for Proud But Protected Bike Lane and One Redmond, um, which helped do some of the activations and activities in Downtown Park. Um, so really encourage you to think creatively about who sponsorships could come from. We're going to dive a little bit more into like our initial vision. So this is a, a map overhead of um, downtown Redmond. Um, you can see the red lines on this map kind of indicate where we wanted street closures. And this is Cleveland Street. For our first year, we wanted to take on what we felt like a, was a manageable closure. Um, this is kind of downtown Redmond Park where you can see the kind of green space surrounded by lots of great seating areas. And then this is a really vibrant street. There's a lot of local businesses there. And um, it, uh, it's already kind of designed to be a festival street. Like if you look at the, the pattern of bricks on the ground and the way they've done the lights overhead, it feels like a street that is um, asking to be pedestrianized. And 
We also had kind of a vision of doing a pop-up protected bike lane on 161st and 164th to connect into this Redmond Central Connector Trail and create kind of a loop, right? Like this was our initial vision. We also initially envisioned this event to um, be on both Saturday and Sunday. Well, this was kind of um, a hard no for the city. Um, so we had a lot of back and forth with the city of Redmond and it was a little bit of a chicken and egg situation where the city was really nervous about closing up Cleveland Street and didn't want to upset businesses or, or residents and there's lots of apartments and condos along Cleveland. However, we couldn't do any outreach to figure out if businesses or residents would like or be upset by this event until we had the permit. So we couldn't do the outreach to kind of really ground truth whether there was going to be excitement or anxiety about this event. Um, and so the city wouldn't let us close Cleveland Street. That just became the, the result. So they came back at us with an another option um, and we ended up expanding it a little bit here to be two blocks oops of 161st street um, downtown redmond park and then the redmond central connector trail and this tiny little bit of cleveland street so our, our event wasn't um the shape that we had desired and it wasn't a loop which is a more traditional open streets kind of format um it's kind of like a little bit of a t um, and we ended up having, you know, really a lot of activation in downtown Redmond Park, and we felt really, um, really happy with the turnout along 161st. Uh, we also um, decided to make it a one day only event. Um, so instead of having it be the whole weekend, it was just one day. So it's kind of another compromise that we made. Um, let's talk a little bit about pandemic challenges. Uh, when we were first planning this event, the vaccine rollout was going really well, and we didn't know about the Delta variant, and we knew um, that outdoor transmission was fairly low risk. So we felt very confident about doing this event. Um, things started to change a little bit, right? As um, we went through the summer, we learned more about Delta and the mask mandates started to come back for Washington State. Um, I just want to acknowledge this was a really challenging time to plan an open streets event. And um, there were some, some things that happened. There were vendors who did not want to participate because of the mask mandate requirements. Um, they Or they wouldn't let their uh, employees come out because they were worried about putting them in a place of exposure. And then, um, you know, we were also holding in our back pocket that we might need to completely cancel. So I think up until about the week of the event, it was really just like, okay, I think we're making a decision that is safe. Um, the point of an open streets event is to have folks moving and spaced out. We had mask required signs up um, everywhere and hand sanitizer and adult and children's masks available. And we did focus on activities where people could really social distance. So in our video, you'll see some people who are not wearing masks, but they are socially distant. Um, so, and outside. So, you know, I think we felt like ultimately we're doing um, right by the public health standards, um, but it was a stressful and challenging element of planning an open streets event, which hopefully we will not have to um, navigate in the future, but we are prepared if we need to. Uh, I think Bill did a great job of talking about vendors of community outreach. Our Open Streets event was a really great way for um, Move Redmond to get out in the community and connect with a lot of folks. And it was also a great opportunity for other local businesses and uh, community organizations to get out and kind of share their outreach materials into the world. Um, it was a really like great element of the event. Um, in the bottom corner, you can see Mary, which is a Indian grocer that's really wonderful up in Redmond. You've got to stop by and check it out. And then some of our partner organizations on the east side of Lake Washington, Complete Streets Bellevue and Kirkland Greenway is kind of all doing great work talking about, you know, the opportunity to change our streets. And then I wanted to talk a little bit more about how this event connects to our advocacy goals. Um, for us, we uh, 
a protected bike lane network in Redmond is one of our top priorities. And um, so we saw an open streets event as a really great way to demonstrate a protected bike lane. On the left, you can see our pop-up protected bike lane. We had a little planter and then these little things called armadillos. They're from Zicla. They're reflective materials that can create kind of a nice barrier for, um, for bike lanes. And we're able to demonstrate that for a two-way bike lane. And we have a city council member, Jessica Forsyth, um, riding her bike through the pop-up protected bike lane. And you can see the map in the back that we have of our proposed routes for protected bike lanes in the city of Redmond. Uh, so this was a great way to engage the public and get them to test out riding on a pop-up protected bike lane. It was awesome to see so many kids um, you know, ride their bikes and scoot through the, the protected bike lanes. And uh, we also had some photos that people were taking of like holding up whiteboard signs of why they supported a protected bike lane network. Um, on the right photo is uh, King County Council member Claudia Belducci, another wonderful champion of transit and biking and walking for King County. Um, we invited a lot of elected officials out to this event and many of them came and had a wonderful time. And this is a great opportunity to show them not only the value of open streets events, but also just the, the power of um, protected bike lanes and what can happen when community really gets together and is out in public. And um, then I wanted to talk a little bit about sharing the story of open streets. Um, we really used a lot of social media the day of to just show people like this is what it can be like when we open up our streets and make them a place for people to play. Um, we also hired a videographer to make some videos for us. One is really promotional and kind of focusing on helping us get geared up for future years and get some more sponsorship for future years. And then we also have one that is um, in creation right now of doing an advocacy video, kind of honing in on the pop-up protected bike lane and that, that campaign. Um, and we're thinking that this kind of communication will not only help build the case for open streets in Redmond, but around the whole of the east side of Lake Washington and Washington as a whole. So we're also really happy to share this with you. Um, I'm going to try to share a video and let me know if the sound doesn't work um, and otherwise we'll just drop it in the chat. So I'm going to escape out of here. Kelly, it doesn't look like the um, audio is coming through okay. this video, unfortunately. Let's uh, let's just drop that in the chat then, and you all can watch the video on your own. So I wasn't quite sure how to get the audio to go through. So, but we do have a video. We'd love for you to check it out. It kind of shows um, some of the activations that went on, as well as had some interviews of attendees, and you can really um, get a sense of the space. So check out our video. We'll also be sharing it. Um, on social media really soon. And then I just wanted to let you know you can stay in touch with our work. Um, we have action alerts that we send out if you want to know what's going on in uh, in Redmond and can sign up at that bit.ly link. You can also become a member of our organization and follow us on all of our social media panels, uh, channels. Um, but that that is all I have and I'm happy to um, take some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly and Bill, for your presentations. Um, it looks like in the chat we've had a lot of excitement about these events and a lot of kudos given to the both of you. So thank you to, to both of you for being such champions of this Open Streets movement and um, getting them going in both of your communities. I have um, a couple of questions ready. Um, some are for both of you, some are for one or the other. So um, I'll start with a question for the two of you. You can go uh, in either order or just or just one answer, whichever. Um, how would you envision this event looking in a post-COVID world? Would you do anything differently or keep the same um, as we're able to host larger events again? 
Well, I can go. I think we have a pretty big vision in Redmond of getting all of downtown Cleveland Street. Um, now that we've kind of built the relationship with the city and have shown that we can do um, a safe and smooth event, we would love to create a loop involving Cleveland Street and then going up and around through downtown. Uh, we really want to encourage folks to, you know, make more of that connection to the light rail station that's coming in, to some of the bus uh, stops too, and really also connect it with our our transit network and really encourage people to take transit to get there. I'll just make the comment that um, one of the phenomenon that, that we've seen for a number of years is, is that people come to the course from other places in the city and congregate in one place, usually by the ice cream truck. Um, and so our, our goal has been to try to get people to go around the course, to make loops around the course um, and that's where this, this passport has worked uh, this year for the, the virtual event where the, the quiz has worked. And so I think we'll continue to, to keep that as a, uh, as a component of what we do uh, and to refine it as, as best as we can. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I have a question specifically for Bill. Someone asked, what's your budget for putting on an event like this? Uh, it's in the it's in the five thousand dollar range now. Probably what what would be the most expensive component um, would be the police presence, uh, and that's and we we've been receiving that as a sponsorship uh, from the city. But but probably if you included if you included the uh, the police costs, it would probably in the in the range of somewhere between five and ten thousand dollars. I'm, I'm going to follow up. Ours was a lot more expensive because we did not get sponsorship from the city. So our permit costs and um, and the cost of the police was noted was more than that. And then um, for us, we also had we also had a larger budget that we created for um, being able to pay some of the organizations to be there um, and also um, paying for promotions and marketing and having a videographer. So we we had a larger budget than that. Um, and I think we could we could see ha having a larger budget allowing for more um, more capacity to especially get um, other organizations that we wanted to be out so they can pay their employees for their time. So those were some things that I wanted to chime in on budget. If I, if I could just make a comment, I interesting, uh, interesting part about getting uh, about paying the organizations to be there. We, we have our vendors pay us to be there uh, and the ones that are nonprofits get to be there for free. Yeah, it was like a little bit of a mix. We had some people who we paid because we wanted them to be there and then others were like local businesses who could pay us. So yeah, it's a, it's a, we're learning a lot about, you know, what's gonna work too. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure people in the in the um, participating in, in this um, or listening in this panel are like learning a lot about the um, uh, logistics of getting one of these events off the ground. So thank you to both of you. Um, I have a, some of a follow up question to something Bill just mentioned. Um, so given what we know about different communities comfort and trust level with the police, what considerations um, have you given to having no police presence or other mitigation factors at these events? Um, and like, so are, are traffic control requirements set by these by study, study permits, do you, you know, are these, um, is this a requirement as, as part of putting on um, an event like this in your communities? You know, I don't, I don't know that there's a necessity of having police for, for security or for crowd control or for anything else. We have them specifically to cross arterials. Uh, and that, and that was a requirement. We were told that, uh, that our volunteers uh, don't have enough credentials to control traffic, to actually be able to to put up a hand and stop traffic and, and wave people through. It was a requirement of our permit. For, for traffic control or for, for just general security? They were at each intersection, even ones where there was no real traffic control. Wow. It was a challenge. I would say that was a challenge and that was part of what um, increased our budget as well. So it made it actually challenge, more challenging to put on this event. Okay, thank you for the feedback. Yeah, if it's a, a requirement. Um, let's see. 
Kelly, I have a question specifically for you. Um, you spoke to your advocacy work in relation to the Open Streets event, how you kind of tied in the two. Um, so how do you envision Open Streets events being used to garner buy-in from elected officials? And what advice would you have for other advocates on how to connect to elected officials in this way? Yeah, so I mean, having the pop-up protected bike lane was um, a really critical piece of our um, event in large part because there are no protected bike lanes in the city of Redmond. And so we wanted to create a demonstration bike lane using materials that are realistic that the city could potentially, you know, purchase themselves. So that's where we got the in-kind sponsorship from Zikla. Um, and they sent us the little armadillos and the planters and we allowed and invited the the elected officials to ride through the protected bike lane. So they had the chance to see what it's like to be in a physical barrier. And then also the opportunity to see what how um, that kind of infrastructure is more comfortable for um, families. And we saw lots of kids feeling safe and using that also in large part because the streets were fully closed, right? Um, so for us, it was kind of this way of um, showing them how possible it is. Um, and especially with, uh, you know, with Redmond, we're getting light rail really soon and we want to have protected bike lanes to have people help access the light rail stations by bike. We know people cannot drive, um, cannot drive and park to, for the light rail. Not everybody's going to be able to do that. So we want to show them it's possible to make a protected bike lane before light rail it opens. Um, and so that's kind of a big piece of our goal was to show them like we set this up in a half hour and it's possible so we can do this in the timeline that we have. Um, and then I think it also just provided an opportunity for more of our elected officials to get on board with our idea, our idea that there should be a, a network of protected bike lanes. You know, they saw it, they could see that people would use it and it became more real to them rather than just some lines on a map that we drew. Yeah, that's excellent. I was wondering, Bill, if you had any thoughts on on whether that's something that would happen in Spokane as well. Um, I'm noticing that one of our attendees is is Rhonda Young, who is a uh, uh, an engineering professor at Gonzaga, uh, who has who has been uh, involved in uh, the development of some several greenways in Spokane, uh, and uh, and our we've had as part of our plans uh, to have uh, pop-ups to demonstrate this uh, during the event. Um, I think I think there was also, there was at one point where, um, where we were gonna have a demonstration of, of parklets uh, at the event. All right. Um, really, I really appreciate the quality of questions that are coming in as well. And thank you too for answering along the way. Um, uh, my next one is how do you see open streets events interacting with conversations on equitable access to public space? Um, so how can, how can we use events like these as a tool for equity? Either one of you. Okay. <laughs> we, uh, as, as I mentioned, in our first few years, we tried several different neighborhoods to have these in. And we, we did them, we did several events in uh, uh, neighborhoods that, that uh, probably had less, uh, less inclination towards recreational opportunities. Um, and we didn't do well, and we've scratched our heads as to how to as to how to be more inclusive of different neighborhoods around the city. Um, it just it just didn't work, um, but it but but it's on our minds to keep on trying. Um, you know, I think this is our first year, so it's a pretty big experiment and seeing how it would work overall. Um, I would love to start our organizational um, outreach with partners who we want to be there. Um, you know, I think specifically in Redmond, um, there's the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, um, there's Central Cultural Mexicano. Um, those are some organizations who we had invited them to be there this year, but we're not able to make it because we had a pretty short 
um, timeline. We, we plan this event in just four months. Um, so I think start the, the planning with fewer um, sets, like fewer, uh, a less fully sketched out version in mind and work with um, some of the communities who would like to participate and see what would work um, work for them and, and work from a, building a really deep relationship with organizations and communities that we would like to see um, be at the Open Streets event and, um, you know, how to, how to create a space that felt really inclusive and welcoming. I think one thing we did really well this year was, you know, we had a sponsorship for Mary. They have the Indian grocery store in Redmond. And then we also had the Indian Association of Western Washington out doing community outreach. And that was really clear that like um, our event really got out and connected with folks from the Indian community in Redmond. Um, and that was really clear. So if you build those partnerships with the organizations that already have those relationships um, and can kind of encourage their people to attend open streets events, that can be one way um, to, to, I think, build and invite more folks into the space. Um, I also think the question of police is really important and I wanna lift up what um, Barb Chamberlain commented on that we could really use some organizing about lifting some of the requirements on traffic control that would not only help from a budget perspective, but creating more space um, for folks to, to be really comfortable. You know, we, um, it didn't feel like we really needed the police there for any sort of safety presence. The road closed signs seemed to do a lot of the work of uh, deterring people from driving through the street. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a lot of space for us to explore um, ways to kind of change some of the requirements and shift things. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for calling out Barb's comment as well for the rest of the participants. Um, she had a uh, recommendation or a suggestion that um, just like Kelly is saying that um, if the in, in place of police that um, work zone flaggers, people who are more trained at, you know, um, coordinating traffic um, with the use of flags could could be a replacement strategy um, in place of police as well. We're not sure about how the cost might or might not change, um, but it's just an opportunity for also a different relationship making. And obviously, like Kelly was saying, a different presence on the streets to make it more inclusive for, um, for all of our communities who we'd want to bring to these events. Um, so yeah, excellent, excellent conversation there and definitely something that um, I think events like these need to be thinking about moving forward um, as we keep going on these. And um, sort of on that topic of, you know, timing and scheduling, um, for both of you, what are your thoughts um, on the opportunities and benefits of having a Open Streets event um, as a per year event versus like a series that goes throughout, um, you know, throughout the summer, for example? can start on that one. Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, I think for us, it's a, it's a capacity issue. Um, our team is three people and we brought in an event director to help with this event. Um, so at this point, I feel like an annual thing is the most realistic for us. I think if we could, you know, we would love to see more city buy-in and have the city adopt this as something they wanted to do on a regular basis. Um, you know, throughout the less rainy season from spring to fall. Um, but that's something that would need to really be taken on through the city. Um, they can make that happen a lot. Uh, mm, would they just have more of the resources and capacity than a three-person nonprofit? I complete, completely agree. My sentiments exactly. Okay. We, we've had... We've had a, a bike ped coordinator uh, hired uh, in the past year, who's probably the, the most active bike ped coordinator we've had. Um, and we've had, he and I have had some conversations about the possibility of getting the city involved. He, he comes to us from Salt Lake City where he actually was, uh, was involved in the organization of an open street of, streets event. Uh, done by the city and and uh, I'd love to further those conversations. Awesome. Yeah, I think that would be such a cool opportunity. Uh, but like you said, yeah, total, totally understand the capacity issues as well. Um, 
someone in the um, audience had a thought about um, when you're having these open streets events and mixing um, pedestrians with people who are on um, bicycles, specifically e-bikes, which go at you know somewhat faster speeds. Um, I know Kelly, your event had a separate pop-up pop bike lane so that those on bikes could explore what it feels like to be on that. But um, so maybe this is a question more for Bill, if that's something that's come up with um, just having any sort of um, uh, the, the mix of having people walking and, and biking all on the same streets, um, if that's brought up anything, any issues or whatnot. I think when we first started the event, we, we talked about trying to have some control over it. Um, and and we've, we've cast that notion away. It somehow works. Um, it works. We, we don't need to say it's uh, it's one direction going one way and one direction going the other way. It moves in both directions at the same time. It moves with, with people on foot, with kids on scoot bikes, with, uh, it, with all types of vehicles, and it just seems to work. That's great. It sounds like, you know, cooperation can happen when there's um, no cars on the street. Right. <laughs> All right, let's see. I've got a logistical question for Kelly. Um, how did you acquire these armadillo bumps and install them? Um, I'm going to give a lot of credit to Kirk, our executive director, who had some connections with Zikla. Um, and they are a company based out of Barcelona. And they, you know, it's very common to use the armadillo kind of infrastructure there and they're trying to grow their market in the US and particularly in the Pacific Northwest. And so they were able to send us the materials. Getting the materials was challenging. I don't know if you all have had to try to have any shipped international items, um, including two large pallets of armadillos and planters, but it was down to the wire. Um, we, we somehow got them the day before our event with a lot of um, special support from our event director, Rebecca. Um, it was challenging, but we did get them. We got them on time um, and it was an in-kind sponsorship. So it was one of those things that was really um, an incredible opportunity. And I'm very thankful to Kirk and to Zikla for setting it up. Very cool. Can I ask how far in advance you ordered them just in case any people, any other people are thinking of using these? You know, it was a few months and I would give it as much time as you've got. All right, good to know. <laughs> Oh, let's see. So many good comments and questions coming in. Um, do either of you have a sense of how people transported themselves to the event, whether by driving or walking over, taking transit, etc.? Um, so one of the cool things about the space where we were in downtown Redmond Park, there are so many apartment buildings and condos around it. A lot of people who came to the event saw that something was going outside and just came down the stairs or came down the elevator and came outside to play. Um, I think some folks biked from the, the trail connections. It seems like we got some folks who were just biking by the trail and saw that something was going on. And then we do know some people um, drove from around the city and around the east side to make it there because they saw the promotional materials and they wanted to come. So there were people outside of Redmond who came specifically for this event and then supported small local businesses. So it, it brought some outside business into the neighborhood. Ditto. <laughs> All right. Um, let's think. Okay. Uh, without any financial or permit constraints, what would each of your events look like next year? I think you get to dream big here. I'll go. Sure. I, I think we would do um, we would do a bigger loop that still felt manageable. I think um, you know it would be great to have several miles of open streets. We would love it to include downtown Cleveland Street um, and then take up to like 161st and then maybe go around to 85th and then back down to 164th. That would be a huge selection of. Uh, downtown Redmond that would be really pedestrianized essentially for the day because all of the places kind of inside of it um, would be, yeah, would be really uh, accessible for folks walking or biking. What about you, Bill? Um, 
if if we're back from a if we've recovered from the COVID uh, situation, um, I think we're fairly happy with our event, and I think and I think that it would look pretty much the same. All right. Yeah, you certainly have a variety of activities and, and community uh, involvement in them. It sounds great. Um, oh, a, a question just popped up that I happened to see. Um, both of you have talked about the the shape of the event, the, the structure of the event, and um, just wondering why is a, a loop something to plan for or to to try to achieve in future? Like, what's what's the importance of the a loop structure um, for an open streets event? Good question. Is it just something that seems to make sense, or is there any sort? Um, I'm just curious. Like, yeah, what what does that um, enhance the experience, or how does that enhance the experience? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, any ideas why that was what you were originally planning for? Well, so we were kind of more line with a little loop. Um, I think part of it is that, you know, this year we had a really linear structure mm -hmm. and we had great vendors on the edge of, of the street on 161st. So we had food over here and then some really popular trail advocacy and spin scooters that people could test out. So we had things that um, pulled people towards those edges, but we were a little concerned that they would be getting less of the action because there's kind of the central space where there's downtown park and a bunch of vendors. And so that was kind of the hub of activity. And then it took it took like a real destination for people to go out to the line. So I think the idea of a loop is that um, it kind of draws people back around to those like hubs or places where there's lots of activities. Sure, okay. Yeah, and plus I guess they can just take another lap if they miss something the first time or something like that. Um, okay, well, we're um, getting close on time. So I'm gonna wrap up with one last question again for, for both of you. Um, which is, what would you say is the biggest lesson that you've learned through hosting an open streets event? I think for us that that you need buy-in by the by the the neighborhood that you're doing it in, the neighborhood, or if you're doing it downtown by the downtown uh, the downtown businesses and and residents. Uh, that, that to come in, I, th I think we came into a couple of neighborhoods where we didn't have that and we expected somehow to bowl them over to say, we, we're bringing such a great event in, you're just going to love it. Um, and I think they needed to, needed to have part of the ownership for that to happen. And the ownership needed to include promotion on their part. Promotion in, in local schools, churches, businesses. Yeah, um, I would I would echo that that's one piece of the like, getting lots of buy-in and support. Uh, I think the other piece for me is that, um, you know, we did this in a really short period of time. So it's possible to do in a short period of time. I think if we, you know, the longer you have to plan, the more community support and buy-in you can get, the more folks you can have to come out um, and the, the more intentional you can be about the space that you're creating. And I think we did a really great job in the time period that we have, but I think I, the lesson that I would take for next year is like, I'm gonna reach out to folks in advance sooner so they have more time to kind of plan and prepare um, as well. So giving yourself as much time as possible. And then my other piece of advice is that having an elected champion of this event will help you a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, we are just on time right now. Thank you so much, um, Bill and Kelly, for all the information you shared with us today, all the discussion we just had. Um, thank you to all the attendees for tuning in today and, and asking such great questions and using the chat feature to have good discussions as well. Um, our next session today is at 1230. It's our keynote presentation with Alex Hoggard and Liz Jackson. They are two experts in mobility justice and disability-led design. And uh, you will also find in the chat a feedback form. So please click on that and um, fill it out to let us know your thoughts um, on the summit. Um, thanks again for everybody for participating and we'll hope to see you back at 1230. Hi, thank you. <laughs>